Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldman, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, once again, it's good to see everybody, and I noticed you had your coffee, and you know, it takes a while to get everybody served and back in here, so we appreciate that. We're going to get on program number two. For those of you joining us on television, again, we're just an informal Bible study. I like to compare it to a Sunday school class more than anything, and uh, we're just simply comparing Scripture with Scripture. And my whole idea of this is to get people to study their Bible by themselves. And don't go by what I say. Don't go by what some preacher says. You go by what the book says, because this is how we're going to be judged one day. Okay, now we're looking at a little different approach to Scripture today. We're looking at the whole process of redemption as we see God exercise it in various ways and forms from Genesis to Revelation. And uh, as I mentioned in the last program, I really wanted to do this with the book of Ruth, but I couldn't do it with Ruth alone, so we're just going to have to put it all together and then come back and see where the picture of Ruth and Boaz fix, uh, figures in. All right, we're going to go back now and look at the beginning of the nation of Israel and how God lost them. And again, it's a picture that what was once God's, he lost and he has to redeem them. So let's go all the way back to Genesis chapter 37, and we're going to jump all the way up to when Joseph was having his dreams. And I don't have to rehearse, I think, for most people, that, uh, that Joseph is the dreamer. And I was just reminding me, I remember for those of you out in television, this is the beginning of book number 69. So if you want to know how many programs are in the can, all you have to do is multiply 68 times 12, and when we get to 70, that'll be 840 of them. So that should last quite a while. Okay, Joseph the dreamer. And the brothers are starting to hate him a little bit more all the time. And so finally one day, old father Jacob sends him out to check on the brethren. And they conspire and they say, here comes that dreamer. Let's get rid of him. All right, so dropped all the way down to Genesis 37, verse 19. Because I want you to see how all this took place. That here we have the... Abrahamic covenant has now become a reality. Isaac has come and gone. Jacob has now sired the 12 sons, which will be the 12 tribes of Israel. And here they're coming. We're still in the early stages, of course, but the nation has now gotten a good beginning. And now the brethren in verse 19 said one to another, Behold, this dreamer cometh, which was Joseph. And then they conspire between themselves of what to do with him. And first they want to kill him. And then they decide to throw him into a pit. And you know the story. And so then let's drop down to verse 26 where the eldest of the brethren, Judah, has a little bit of compassion left in him. And Judah said to his brethren, What profit is it if we slay or kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, slave traders, and let not, let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh. And the brethren were content. Now verse 28, here it happens. Then there passed by Midianites, merchantmen, and they drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit, and they sold Joseph to Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver, and they brought him to Egypt. Now that is merely the beginning of the process then that brought the whole nation of Israel down into the land of Egypt and became slaves of the Egyptian pharaohs and so forth. But it all started with the evil thinking and reaction to this godly man, Joseph, who was actually dreaming things that were prophecy. He was dreaming of the time when indeed they would be coming down to Egypt and they'd have to bow down to him in order to get food for sustenance. But of course, None of them understood that as yet. But what we want to show in, in just this little bit here is how that the beginning of the nation under Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the 12 sons is now interrupted by the first step in God's losing them as they go down into Egypt. All right, now we know that after they're in Egypt for a period of time and they come under abject slavery, 
and the persecution and the pressure of the pharaohs, then uh, God's going to do something totally different. Now I'll jump all the way up to Genesis chapter 46, <coughs> and we're going to see how that everybody ends up in Egypt. And it all began with selling Joseph into slavery. Joseph, of course, comes out of prison and becomes the second man in Egypt, puts together the seven years of plenty. You know the story. I don't have to rehearse that. But now we've come to the place where Jacob and the brethren have had to go to Joseph to get grain, not knowing who he was, of course, the first time. But when they went back the second time, then they understood that Joseph was indeed their brother. And Joseph made it known that the brethren were his brethren. And that, of course, is a point that uh, Stephen makes in Acts chapter 7, that for whatever reason, Israel always has to have a second go-around. When the brethren went down to Joseph the first time, they didn't know who he was. They didn't have a clue, but Joseph knew them. But when they came back the second time, then it's revealed who Joseph is, and of course, there's this great reunion. Well, this is all a picture and type, of course, of Christ. The first time he came, he knew them, but they didn't know him. Well, we have the same thing with Moses. You see, Moses went out to the children of Israel, supposing that he could lead them out. But what did they do with Moses? They rejected him. And he was guilty of murder, and so he had to flee for 40 years. Then he comes back the second time, and he becomes the deliverer. Now, these are all pictures in type, which, of course, you know, I, I was thinking again sometime, either during the night or driving up here, you know, this book is just like a huge, beautiful mosaic. Now, I don't think many people understand the beauty of a mosaic unless you get to the Middle East and see some of the archaeological uncoverings over there of these beautiful mosaics, these little chips of stone. Well, I think the most beautiful one we ever saw was the lady at Sephora. You remember that, honey? And it was in a huge mosaic, almost a quarter the size of this room. And in one central part of the mosaic was a beautiful face of a young lady. But it was like a Mona Lisa, because you know why? No matter where you stood from that face, it was looking at you. You could look over here, it was looking at you. You stand in front, it was looking at you. Over here. Well, you see, I like to compare that as a, as a crude, a crude illustration. But this is a beautiful mosaic. All the little pieces, when they come together, are flabbergasting. But people will just reject it out of hand. You know, I always have to think of a survey I think lawyers took up in Iowa years and years and years ago. And this one believing lawyer asked all the members of the Bar Association, I think it was in Iowa, forgive me if I'm wrong, but he just asked two questions. Do you believe the Bible is the Word of God? And then the second question is, if you said no, have you ever read it? Well, you know what the result was? About 90% no, they didn't believe the Bible. Had they ever read it? 100% said no, they'd never read it. And so they reject it out of hand, not even having a clue of what they're rejecting. But you see, it is such a beautiful mosaic that everything fits. But you have to dig it out. It isn't going to unfold like a fifth grade reader necessarily. But yet it's simple enough, like I said in the last half hour, that anybody can understand it if they'll just try. You know, when people write and they disagree with me on some of these things, you know what my stock answer is? There's only one reason that you're not agreeing with me. You don't want to. <laughs> and isn't that true? No, they don't want to. And they'll be switched if they'll try. But if they would, and if they'd want to, it's there. It's as plain as day. I make no apology for that. Okay, so here we go back to Israel now. They have just gotten started as a result of the promise made to Abraham and the old devil comes in to these eleven brothers with envy and jealousy, and they sell him down into Egypt. All right, so now then in chapter 46, verse 1, we find that the brethren up there in Canaan are getting short of food, they're hungry, and Joseph has the granaries full in Egypt. 
Now, up until this time, they were warned constantly to never go down to Egypt because Egypt was the biblical picture of the world. God's people don't go to the world for their problems, nor was Israel to go to Egypt. But now, after all these years of don't go to Egypt, God changed it around and he gives the opposite directions. Verse 1 of 46, And so Israel, Jacob, took his journey with all that he had, and he came to Beersheba, which is down south of Jerusalem, present-day Jerusalem, about, I suppose, 75, 80 miles, which makes it just due east from Egypt. And so he came to Beersheba, and he offered sacrifices unto the God of his father Isaac. And God spake unto Israel in the visions of the night, and he said, Jacob, Jacob, and he said, Here am I. Now look what God tells Jacob after all these years of saying, Go not down to Egypt. Now he says, I am God, the God of thy father. Fear not to go down into Egypt, for I will there in Egypt make of you a great nation. Now you know the rest of the story. Jacob and the 11 brethren moved down into Goshen. And under Joseph's authority, they prospered. They had the best producing area of Egypt up there in the delta. And they fared quite sumptuously for quite a few years. But then the scripture tells us that there was another pharaoh who knew not Joseph after he had died. And, of course, he brought in the extreme pressure of the slavery that the children of Israel found themselves under. All right, now then, let's move on up for sake of time to see how God is going to bring about a redemption now of that which he had lost. He has lost the nation of Israel. They are out of fellowship with him. They are under Gentile dominion, but he's going to buy them back. All right, now, this is why I had to bypass the book of Ruth because as we saw with Adam, we're going to see with Israel, we're going to see with Christ and the work for the whole human race. We're going to see at the same time when he pays off old Satan's mortgage in Revelation, there are always three parts of a redemption. Number one, there has to be a person. Now, you might want to write this in your notes. You have to have a person. Number two, it has to be by blood. has to be by blood. It's the only way God can redeem. And the third one is power. Power. And this is why I cannot understand, as I've said it almost every taping lately, why do even our evangelical people avoid the resurrection? They'll speak of his death. They'll speak of his forgiveness. But they just seemingly are remiss in bringing up the resurrection. Because that's where the power lies. That's where the power is. And you cannot have redemption without all three. It doesn't do a bit of good to have the shed blood if you don't experience the power and vice versa. See, So here we're going now in, uh, in the book of Exodus. We're going to jump in and, uh, oh, let's see. I want to go to chapter 11, I think. Exodus chapter 11. Dropping down to verse 6. And this is the night when every firstborn of Egypt is being put to death. Exodus 11, verse 6. Now this is the beginning now then of God redeeming his lost people and bringing them to himself. Exodus chapter 11, verse 6. And there shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as there was none like it, nor shall be like it any more. But against any of the children of Israel shall not a dog move his tongue, against man or beast, that you may know how that the Lord doth put a difference between the Egyptians and Israel. Verse 9, And the Lord said unto Moses, Pharaoh shall not hearken unto you, that my wonders may be multiplied in the land of Egypt. And Moses and Aaron did all these wonders before Pharaoh, and the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, so he would not let the children of Israel go out of his hand. All right, now then, God is going to step in in chapter 12 with the first step of redemption. And what's it going to be? 
first the person, which is Moses. And that's right off the bat in verse 1. See? Exodus chapter 12, verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses. He's going to be the person that God is going to use in this instance. So he spoke unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you, which, of course, is our month of April. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. If the household be too little, let him and his neighbor next to him take it according to the number of the souls, every man according to his eating. And these are the instructions now leading up to the very first Passover, the night that the Egyptians were losing their firstborn. And Israel is gathered in their little houses, their huts, whatever the case may be. It's nighttime. They're not sitting at the table. They are what? They're standing. Okay, let's move on. They were to keep, they were to pick out a lamb, verse 5, without blemish, a male of the first year, taking it out from the sheep or from the goats. Now remember, they were to take it out on the tenth day, and they were to watch it until the fourteenth day of the same month. And of course, the whole purpose was to make sure that there was nothing remiss about this little sacrificial animal. It had to be perfect. No injury, no sign of sickness. It had to be absolutely perfect. All right, so after the fourteenth day of the same month, the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. Now here comes the next part of redemption. And they shall take the blood. Now remember what we said in the first half hour. Hebrews says, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. I wish I could just give a beautiful, simple illustration as to why God always demands the said blood. I can't. I got an idea, but I cannot explain it enough that everybody would be satisfied. The closest I can come is that all through the, the process of salvation, redemption, whatever the case may be, we have to have death, and out of death comes life. Now, Genesis tells us that life is in the blood. Now, this is not enough to satisfy everybody. I know it isn't, but it's as far as I can go. Now, since life is in the blood, that blood has to experience death so that out of death can come new life. Now, we see it in the plant families of the earth. When that seed is planted, it dies, and out of that death comes new life. And so this is the only thing that I'm able to put on. Why does God always demand the shed blood? It's a fact of Scripture. We can't escape it. Whether they like it or not, you cannot take it away. All right, so here again, we had to have the sacrificial Passover lamb, and its blood had to be applied on the doorposts of their little huts in Egypt. And that blood would spread would spare them and would secure them from the death that was going across the land of Egypt. All right, verse 7 again. They shall take the blood, strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door of the house, wherein they shall eat the Passover lamb. They shall eat the flesh in that night, roasted with fire, with unleavened bread, with bitter herbs shall they eat it. And they were not to eat it raw, nor sodden or boiled in water, but it had to be roasted with fire. The head with the legs and the pertness thereof, and you shall let nothing of it remain till the morning, and that which remaineth until the morning you shall burn with fire. All right, now then verse 12. While they are in enjoying the Passover lamb with the blood of safety on the doorpost, verse 12, God says, I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, man and beast, and against all of the gods, plural, everything in Egypt was a god, remember, and so against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment, I am the Lord. Now verse 13, and the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass 
over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. Now that's the beginning of the Passover. And Jews to this day are still celebrating Passover, even though they're missing, I think for the most part, all the spiritual ramifications. But yet this has always been part of Israel's history, all the way since 1500 B.C. And here is the reason, verse 26 of this same chapter. And all this just says it all. Why do our Jewish people still practice Passover when they don't believe in the God of the Passover? Here it is. Verse 26, And it shall come to pass when your children... Now, are kids active in the Passover? Absolutely they are. When, when, they, when they hide... What do they hide? The piece of bread? Huh? Yeah, they hide, they, they hide the matzah. And whose prerogative is to go through the house and find it? The children. They become an active part of the Passover feast. Okay, here it comes. Here's the reason. Oh, God knows how to do things. And so it shall come to pass when your children shall say unto you, What mean you by this service? Why are we doing this, Daddy? Why are you hiding something and that we go and find it? Well, to get them involved, to give them an understanding. Now verse 27. When the kids shall say, why are we doing this? Then the scripture says, you shall say, it is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt when he smote the Egyptians and delivered our houses. And the people bowed their heads and worshiped. And the children of Israel went away and did as the Lord had commanded. And so they did. All right, now then, let's just jump over a little further and come down now to chapter 14, where Israel is now escaping Egypt. Miraculously, the whole scope of Israel, and I maintain there were six, seven million of them. Now, for the longest time, I never heard anybody say anything more than six, seven hundred. But then it wasn't long, I'd see people say three million. Then it wasn't long, four million. Now I'm reading more and more people who are agreeing with me. It was more like seven million. And I think that was pretty much the average population of Israel all the way up through their history. And then, lo and behold, I was reading the editorial by the Jewish editorial writer, Krauthammer. And you know, miracle of miracles. You know what Israel is close to today? They are real close to six million people in Israel. Six million. Now, there's 15 million worldwide, but they're getting close to six million. Now, the first thing I had to think of, now I'm, ram I'm rambling, I'm chasing rabbits. Sorry about that. <laughs> but you know what I had to think of when he said six million people in Israel? What was the number of the men of war when Israel began winning everything all the way up through their history? What was the number that they had to have? No. 600,000. When they reached 600,000 men of war, nobody could beat them. And I think the same thing happened in 1948 or 67. Israel had the 600,000 men of war, and nobody can beat them. Now, when I saw 6 million, that's just another multiplication of 600,000. See? So, well, there, there's the mosaic. There's your mosaic again. Everything fits, see? Okay, so now then, chapter 14. We only got three minutes left. Just about four. Chapter 14. They have now escaped out of Egypt. And they're gathered on the banks of the Red Sea. Why bring us to the banks of the Red Sea? We don't have boats. We don't have rafts. What are we going to do? And I imagine about that time they could see the dust clouds behind them of Pharaoh's army. Can you see the panic? Can you feel it? What are we going to do? There's no place to go. And the Egyptians are coming. Verse 13. Of all things to tell seven million people. Now remember, they had a chain of command. Moses didn't stand someplace and yell at six, seven million people. But they had a chain of command that just went like wildfire. And what was his, uh, his command? Stand still. Are you kidding? 
The Egyptians are behind us. They'll slaughter us. But God says, stand still. Or Moses, by God's instruction, Moses said to the people, fear not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show to you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you shall see them again no more forever. Do you suppose those Jews had even an inkling of what was about to happen? They had no idea. They couldn't dream of all of a sudden the waters parting, but there they did. Now what's this? We've had the blood on the doorposts. We've had Moses as God's spokesman. Now what do we got? Power. Power. The power of God opens that Red Sea, not just for 40, 50 feet. It must have been for miles because 7 million people cross on dry ground in a matter of hours. You see that? What a miracle. And, of course, it became part of Israel's history, one of the greatest miracles in all of Israel's history, how that God opened the Red Sea. All right, now then, in the minute we have left, I hope I've got your imagination running. Here these seven million walk through the Red Sea on dry ground. Not a drop of water touches them. And as soon as they come up on the other side, the water comes back and destroys their enemy. Now what's the picture for you and I? That's our salvation. That's our salvation. When we recognize that we're a lost sinner, we're undone, does God say, well, get to work and do something? Does God say, go find a preacher and get baptized? Does God say, well, learn how to speak in tongues? What does he say? Don't try to do anything. I've done it all. I've died for you. I've shed my blood. I've already experienced the power of resurrection. I'm ready to give it to you. If you'll just stand still and believe it. And I can't make it any plainer. And so this is the perfect picture now then of Israel losing their identity with God for ever so long, almost 200 and some years, and then God redeems them with the use of a person, with the shed blood, and with the power of opening the Red Sea. And so Israel comes out on the other side now, a redeemed nation of people. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552, or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with...